Good afternoon and good morning to our West Coast friends. My name is Aniket and I'm the product line leader for materials characterization portfolio with Perkin Elmer. I hope everyone is keeping safe during these times. We're here today to kick off a four-part virtual workshop series on FGIR analysis in partnership with the Society for Applied Spectroscopy. We will meet every Thursday at this time throughout the month of October to learn about various facets involved in FGIR analysis and interpretation. Uh, broadly, our topics will cover elements on instrumentation and instrument-related issues, understand the principles of ATR technique, as well as cover some uh, other sampling accessories. Finally, we will also take a deep dive on sample prep and data handling problems in our final lecture. Throughout this workshop series, our guest speaker will be Dr. Alan Misio. Dr. Misio has been involved in vibrational spectroscopy and instrument development for her entire career. She is currently the Chief Technical Officer at Teak Origin, whose mission is to use spectroscopy in food supply chain and determine quality and authenticity. Ellen received her BS in chemistry from St. Francis College in Brooklyn, New York, and her PhD in physical chemistry from the Polytechnic Institute of New York, which is now a part of New York University. She was originally trained as a physical chemist and has broad expertise in IR analysis in the food sciences and materials characterization space. She is currently the president of the Copeland Society and has served as the president-elect, president, and past president for the Society for Applied Spectroscopy between 2015 and 2017. Um, for our talk today, we'll specifically draw attention to FTIR instrument problems that show up in the IR spectrum. This talk will focus on instrument issues and how to quickly determine if the instrument might have a problem or show up an artifact and how to optimize the collection to obtain best quality data. If you have questions throughout this talk, please use the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen to send us questions throughout this talk, and we will take all the questions towards the end of it. Also, feel free to share this workshop invitation with other folks in your lab or the company at large, and we will continue meeting every Thursdays in October again. With that, I'll turn this over to Ellen. Ellen, this is all yours. Things that you will see in the spectrum that are actually um, due to um, an instrument not performing. Okay. So, um, as I said, as I said, the um, instrument may actually be broken may actually be um, slightly broken. And it's the analyst's job to um, understand what the spectrum should look like so that you know when things are right and when things are uh, showing up wrong. Now, one of the first things you should look at is what's called a single beam. And the single beam is basically the instrument's response to the light that's passing through when the spectrometer beam is empty. No accessories, no sample holders. And with that, you should see possibly a little bit of carbon dioxide and a little bit of water vapor. And the shape of this single beam will be indicative of what the health of the instrument is. Now, what I'm going to show you are spectra that have been taken from an instrument that's at my disposal. So although the plots may not look exactly the same, you will see these types of um, plots. Now, the single beam that I'm showing right now is very good you see a little bit of carbon dioxide, a little bit of water vapor, and it's showing the energy response from the instrument. This comes from a well-aligned, well-purged instrument with no accessory in place. 
in this particular single beam that I'm showing you, we can see that there's a substantial amount of water vapor, a substantial amount of carbon dioxide. And over here where the red arrow is, we're seeing what's called non-physical energy. Non-physical energy is due to a situa situation where the, detec the detector is saturated. Sometimes this happens in microscopes with, mer with mercury cadmium telluride detectors that are liquid nitrogen cooled. But when you see non-physical energy, that can indicate that your spectra are not going to behave properly when you're trying to do quantitative analysis. So understanding what to look for in with non-physical energy is a good clue whether you're going to be able to get good um, quantitative analysis. And if you look at the previous one, you see that we see no non-physical energy. This is down to zero. In this particular single beam, what we're looking at is we're looking at a couple of things. This was done through a diamond ATR. So we see the diamond phonon absorptions, but we also see a substantial um, dip over here. And what this represents is this represents a mercury cadmium telluride detector where we were having, uh, where the vacuum was broken. So when you poured liquid nitrogen into it, there was icing inside. And this is basically a spectrum of ice. So looking at something like this will show you that you've got a problem with the detector. This is a very bad single beam. This is basically an instrument that is totally out of alignment. And being out of alignment could be due to a number of different cause, causes. Um, the absolute alignment of the interferometer could be off. The electronics could be broken so that as data points are supposed to be coming into the data file, they're being missed. Or um, when you have an interfer interferometer type instrument, you have what's called a center burst where all of the energy is um, at a maximum. And if the center burst is not at zero, when the Fourier transform is done, you can get this type of pattern. So if you see something like this, the instrument's broken. Now, sometimes the problem is not necessarily in the instrument itself, but it could be in the accessory. Again, we're looking at a diamond ATR. Okay, so you can tell that by the phonon bands right here. And in the blue trace, this is dirty. There was some material left on the ATR element. And you can see that by the CH stretch here. And there are uh, there's a little bit of an absorbance at about a thousand wave numbers. So what this is indicating is that you have a dirty background and you are not going to get a good spectrum. Now, carbon dioxide and water vapor are things that you have to cope with in an FTIR. And this single beam is actually a very good single beam, but we see that we have a substantial amount of water vapor and a substantial amount of CO2. Um, this is going to sound like a joke, but I am 100% serious. When the analysts in my lab are working and they're changing samples, I suggest that they hold their breath because you can easily get this type of intensity change just from breathing into the sample compartment. Now, as an instrument ages, you will see changes in the response curve, the single beam, and it's due to minor changes in the optics and things like that. This single beam is from a 10-year-old, actually, right now, that instrument is probably closer to 15 years old. 
But although the pattern of the single beam is not perfect, this instrument is still very usable. So once you've looked at the single beam and said, yep, this looks like what I expect, the next thing you want to do is you want to look at what's called a 100% line. And a 100% line is obtained by running your background, typically 16 scans at four or eight wave numbers, and then without putting any sample in the sample compartment, take another spectrum and ratio them in percent so that you can see what kind of features may show up on that line. This first one is a very good 100% line. We see a tiny bit of water vapor. The line is exactly at 100%. Um, there's a little tiny bump from carbon dioxide, but this is a very good 100% line from a very well-purged instrument. This is the kind of 100% line you will expect to see when you're working through an accessory. This was done through a, um, an ATR. Now, a couple of questions. Why is it more noisy? Because when you put an ATR accessory into the sample compartment, it is attenuating the light, so you're going to see more noise. But it's at 100%, it's very flat, we're seeing some minor changes that are due to carbon dioxide changing. Very good 100% line to look at. This is also a very good 100% line. And what we're seeing here, though, is a little upwards bend. Why does this happen? If we think back to what the single beam looked like, there was very little energy in this area of the spectrum. And when you ratio a very little energy um, file again, or area against a very little energy area, you'll get some uncertainty in the line. And that's what this is showing. But in general, this is a very good 100% line. The reason I keep saying this is because now I'm going to show you some pretty bad ones. Um, the first one that I'm showing you has spikes in it. You can see these spikes down here. The spikes that we're seeing in this particular 100% line were due to vibrations. And um, in this case, the instrument, which was a research instrument, was placed very close to a hood that was drawing very, very, um, drawing a lot of air, and the blower was shaking a bit. So we see vibrations here. These types of spikes you do not want to see in your 100% line. This one, the next one, shows a little spike at about 1758 wave numbers. Um, that could be due to electrical interference. If the instrument has a grounding problem, uh, you'll see a spike at that wave number region which translates to 60 hertz. If, it's, if you're operating with um, 50 hertz power, you'll see the same thing at about 630 wave numbers. And both of these are due to problems with grounding. Don't confuse this with a CO2 peak, where CO2 also has another peak in addition to the really big one, it has one at about 667 wave numbers. Okay, you if you start to see features on your 100% line, typically this means that you really have a problem with the instrument. In this particular case, there was a problem with the instrument and the electronics where co-addition, that is adding together each scan, in order to get you your data file. Co-addition was not working properly. And interpolation, which is putting in data points throughout the file, which is a standard practice for FTIR, was not working right. So what you were starting to see was some features on the spectrum that don't belong there. And um, 
this was basically indicative of the instrument being broken. In the next one, what we're looking at is uncompensated water vapor and CO2. And this is something really to keep an eye on because from a lot of analytical applications, you're going to see features of interest in this 1800 to about 1400 wave number region, and you certainly don't want water vapor um, confusing the issue. This is a very interesting bad single beam. This particular instrument had a internal polystyrene standard so that in doing the tests of the instruments, you could tell the software to flip the polystyrene up into the beam so that you could get a spectrum of it and then flip it down. In this particular case, the polystyrene flipper was stuck in the up position, so it was in the beam. And what, we, what was happening here is they were collecting both the sample and the background through the polystyrene. Now, for those of you who remember what a polystyrene spectrum looks like, you'll remember that there is a very strong band here in polystyrene, which was not ratioing out, and over here. So this is something stuck in the beam, and in this particular case, it was the polystyrene flipper. Um, this is a very interesting, very bad 100% line. Modern FTIRs are designed to minimize the amount of impact that you see from electromagnetic interference. But in this particular case, I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing and I put my cell phone on top of the instrument so that I could do something and it rang while I was collecting data. So we can see all of the spikes from the electromagnetic interference. Uh, keep your cell phone away from the instrument. Um, now this is one where I've actually collected a sample. It's not 100% line because I wasn't able to get one, but we do see an unusual spike here. This, when you've looked at enough spectra, you recognize that in this region of the spectrum, there are very few things in the mid-infrared that are going to absorb. That's an unusual place to have um, an absorbance. And if we look really closely at it, it's really not an absorbance. It actually looks a little bit like an interferogram. And what was happening here is there was an accessory in place and there was a back reflection. And that back reflection was generating a sine wave, which Fourier transformed into a spike. So I've discussed a little bit about the two things that you should look for to start out with how your instrument is working. And all of this comes into the quality control, quality assurance that you want to be doing with your instrument. Um, for those of you who work in a regulated environment, you know that there is an operational qualification procedure that you perform to make sure the instrument is performing up to the way it should. And typically that's done after a major repair, after maintenance, after you change a source because every single one of those can impact the um, instrument itself. And when you do this quality, operational quality assurance, you should do it on every accessory you've got. So if you've got a spectrometer that's collect, connected to a microscope, you want to do it on both the spectrometer and the microscope. If you use a spectrometer almost exclusively with an ATR, you want to do it with an empty beam, and with the ATR. Now, performance qualification, though, is something you do on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that your instrument is working properly and that the data that you're getting is exactly what you should be getting. Most modern instruments have built into them a performance qualification routine that's based on an ASTM standard 
The number is E1421 for anyone who wants to look it up. And it's built in, and you would run that when you start your, before you start collecting data for the day. And by having those qualifications, making sure that the instrument passes, and then saving the information, you can actually determine if my, A, if my instrument is working, and B, if there's a slow degradation in the instrument performance. So most instruments have the OQ and PQ built into them. And as one of my co-instructors in the live course would say, you click the button, you go get some coffee, and you come back and the PDF is either on the screen or on the printer. And we can thank the instrument vendors for this because before this was started to be built into the instruments, this was something that you had to do manually. So what did this test usually do? Well, the first thing it does is it looks at what's called a signal to noise ratio. And that's the amplitude of the signal versus the noise on the 100% line. I showed you a bunch of 100% lines. It also looks for the deviation from 100%. It looks at the interferogram. I haven't shown you, unfortunately, I haven't shown you any interferograms, but the amplitude of the center burst can tell you a lot about the instrument's alignment. You'll look at the single beam, that's the single channel spectrum, the energy distribution. It will look at an X axis calibration and it will look at a Y axis calibration. And typically that's done with polystyrene. So this test will run and it will give you a printout that you can use day to day to, to check the health of your instrument. And I will say this flat out, doing this routinely is incredibly important. This morning, I spent my time dealing with an instrument that's located in the UK where we have, it's not an FTIR, but it's still an optical instrument, where we have a very unsophisticated user and something is wrong. And by being able to go back and look at the data that was collected on that instrument every single time it was used, we're using that to diagnose what's wrong with that instrument. The OQ tests are performed annually or after some major um, repair that's done. And here there's a lot more that is done with the uh, tests. And typically this is done by a service engineer. Um, as it says, if you're lucky and you have a service contract, the engineer comes in, he does the preventive maintenance, and then he runs the tests and you have the results. But what are some of the things that are done? There's a resolution test. That resolution test is making sure that your instrument meets its spec resolution. There's a sensitivity test. Am I seeing the bands that should be there at the right level? Does the single beam look the way it should? Is the x-axis appropriate? Is the y-axis appropriate? Ha am I collecting data and it's taking the right amount of time? And what, I, what we mean by that is, in a lot of cases now, modern instruments are designed so that they can eliminate a bad scan. But if every other scan is bad, what you're going to find is it takes twice as long to collect that data as you would expect. That indicates there's something wrong with the instrument. So these tests are done and will indicate the performance of the instrument and how well it's working. Okay, we've talked about the instrument and when you walk up to it, what you should be doing, but there are other situations that can occur with an instrument that where the instrument may not actually be broken, but there are other issues that you wanna think about. 
And the first one is keeping the optical path the same. In some instruments, if there is no beam attenuator, what people will do is they'll close down the resolution aperture or the J-stop in order to attenuate the energy. That happens especially if you're using something like a mercury cadmium detect mercury cadmium telluride detector. And what you see is the top um, 100% line is the J-stop in the same position for the sample in the background. In the middle one, if you look at it, it really doesn't look right. It looks funny in the middle of the spectrum around the CO2. The J-stops were not exactly the same. And when you blow that up, you can start to see that the water vapor has derivatized features. The CO2 has derivatized features. There's a funny lump. What's this due to? This is due to not keeping the optical path the same so that the beam that was going through the spectrometer is not exactly the same so that the de detector is not seeing the light from the same geometry and you're starting to get these optical effects. Now, what I'm going to talk about next is the resolution. Uh, higher resolution is better, right? Wrong. Um, in most condensed phase materials, solids and liquids, bands in the mid-infrared are uh, approximately 10 wave numbers of full width at half max. So what does that mean? That means that when you run spectra at much, much higher resolution than you would um, then you have to use, you're going to start to introduce noise into the spectrum and you're going to take more time. And if we look at the, at this set of single beams, we can see that we have very low, this was collected in about 32 wave numbers, 16, 8, 4, I think this was one, 2 or 1, Half. You can see as we're collecting data at higher and higher resolution, you're starting to introduce noise. That's expected. But the thing that isn't always recognized is when you collect higher and higher resolution data, each individual scan is taking more and more time. What I'm showing here is the CH stretching region from polystyrene. And we can see that when you collected 32 wave numbers, uh, which took less than five seconds, we're not getting the resolved peaks from the aromatic CHs nor from the aliphatic CHs. When we collected 16 wave numbers, you're starting to see a resolution. And that's taken about 15 seconds. Um, when you collected eight wave numbers, which took about 30 seconds, you're starting to see the resolved peaks. Four wave numbers, about a minute. Oh, that looks the way it should. Two wave numbers, looks the way it should. And now you're up to two minutes. If you go up to the highest resolution that this instrument was capable of, which is a tenth of a wave number resolution, you see that other than the noise at the top of this peak, you haven't gained anything in looking at the resol resolved bands. And you've gone from a minute data collect time, which is four wave numbers, which would have been perfectly adequate, to 16 minutes. So what does this mean? It means that you've just taken much more time to collect the data and you really haven't gained anything. So you really want to use the right, the appropriate resolution for the sample. And what does that mean? For condensed phase materials, my recommendation would be you want to collect at four, maybe two wave numbers. So that would be for liquids and solids. 
and that would probably cover about 95 percent of everything that's done in most modern analytical labs. If you're using an ATR, you want to collect at that resolution. If you're looking at a liquid in a liquid cell, you want to collect at that resolution. The only place you would want to collect at a much higher resolution would be if you're looking at a gas phase sample. Now, a gas phase sample is going to show very, very sharp bands due to both the rotational and vibrational um, absorptions. And in a lot of cases, people will be very interested in that. So that's the only time you want to collect at a very high resolution is when you're collecting gas phase spectra. Appetization function. Okay. Um, I talked a little bit about interferograms. And if you think about what an FTIR does, you're collecting an interferogram. That interferogram is being Fourier transformed, which gives you out a spectrum. In the process of doing that Fourier transform, there's um, a function that's applied that's called an appetization function. This is what an interferogram looks like, OK? And an appetization function is a mathematical smoothing function that you apply to the raw interferogram. Um, when you go and look at a Fourier transform mathematically, it tells you that it should be done from minus infinity to plus infinity, but our data set is finite. So you apply these appetization functions in order to smooth out the data. There are a whole series of appetization functions that have been implemented by most instrument vendors. Um, and what I've done is I've put terminology that all of the instrument vendors I'm familiar with use. Some instrument vendors use weak, medium, and strong appetization functions. Some use the name of the mathematical function, like Blackman-Harris or Norton Beer Medium. And they're listed over here. Um, for most... And for most applications, you want to stick with medium appetization functions, which are going to give you a good compromise between smoothing out your features and getting rid of those artifacts that will be introduced when your um, will be introduced when you're uh, doing the Fourier transform on a um, file that isn't appetized. And typically, the artifacts that are introduced are these ringing type features at the bottoms of bands. So in general, the medium appetization functions are the ones you want to use for most condensed phase materials. Why am I talking about appetization functions? Because the appetization functions can actually affect the shape of the band. And what we're looking at here are some of the CH bends, again, in polystyrene. And this was the exact same interferogram that was collected. And the instrument that I was using here allowed me to go back and post-process to change the appetization function. Boxcar appetization which is basically no appetization, gives you the sharpest bands. That's why you want to use it for uh, gas phase spectra, so that you can get the absolute position. The medium appetization functions, like triangular and Norton Beer medium, are the ones in the middle here. And you can see that they haven't really grossly impacted the um, band shape. A strong appetization function, which is a four-term Blackman-Harris, you can see that the band shape has broadened out substantially. So you so note the effect of changing the appetization function on the full width at half max of your sample. Again, 
you want to keep it unless there is a real research reason why you want to do it. You really want to keep it at the medium appetization functions. And why do you want to do that? Well, um, uh, okay, let's go back to what appetization functions are. They're a smoothing function. And when you smooth, you're going to broaden out the shape of a peak. Uh, and it's going to change the line shape. It, it will change the area under the curve if you just defined limits that you're going to calculate it on. So it can impact adherence to Beer's law. And mismatched appetization functions can produce artifacts in spectra. Okay, this is polystyrene with a boxcar appetization. And if we look closely, we can see that the aromatic CH and the CH bends and the uh, aromatic ring the aromatic modes, this just doesn't look right. This is because this is an unappetized spectrum. If we look at that exact same spectrum, taken Fourier transformed with the Norton beer medium appetization, we can now see that this spectrum looks exactly like what we expect. If, unfortunately, you mix appetization functions between collecting your background and your sample, you are going to get lots and lots of artifacts in the spectrum. And the instrument that this was collected on accidentally had parameter sets that were defined and the user, one user had gone in and used the instrument with Blackman-Harris appetization. And then a second user had come in and had not changed the defined parameter files for collecting the background and then changed it when they went to collect the sample and their sample looked like this. So basically by mismatching your appetization functions, you can again introduce artifacts into your spectrum. Now, I said that you want to use boxcar appetization on gas phase spectra. And what we have here is carbon monoxide in a cell, in a gas cell, at six tor. This is a standard test that's used to test the resolution of an instrument. And we can see on the bottom spectrum where we're using boxcar appetization, that peak is very sharp. And if we were to measure the full width at half max of that peak, we would see that it's within the defined resolution for that gas phase spectrum, which I believe for these spectra were done at a 10th wave number. Again, taking exactly the same data file and using triangular appetization, which is the one up, we can see the band has started to broaden. And if we go up to Blackman Harris and Norton Beer, you can start to see that you're changing the shape of the band. This type of shape change most, is most important to recognize when you're doing gas phase spectra, or if you are trying to test the resolution of the instrument. Don't do this experiment with the CO at six tor, and then use a Blackman-Harris appetization and complain to the instrument vendor that the instrument is not meeting specs because it has nothing to do with whether the instrument meets specs. It's how the Fourier transform was done. So, we have gone through the first pieces about where you can, how you would um, identify problems that are present from the instrument. And um, at this point, um, I'll answer whatever questions are coming. I'd like to mention that this uh, presentation, there's two professional societies who deal with vibrational spectroscopy. One is the Koblenz Society, 
and the other one is the Society for Applied Spectroscopy. So, with that said. Thank you, Ellen. Um, there are a few questions that have come up. Um, let's start with a few here. Now, when you started, you did mention about an ice band that you pointed in spectra. Now, unfortunately, your pointer wasn't visible uh, to the audience, so they missed a few things that you were showing with the pointer. But if you okay. could back to the slide and point out where the ice band was. Mm -hmm. I brought back to, this, to the slide, and you can see, if you think about what a single beam looks like, the curve should be going up. And what we're seeing right here is we're seeing an absorption. This is the absorption of ice. This is the larger of the absorptions that you will see in the spectrum. Okay? All right, thank you. Um, and, and everyone, you know, this is the time, we have some time uh, with us. If you have questions, use the Q&A tab and send us questions now and we can take it up here. Um, the other question that, that we see here is, um, how do you explain the up and down drifts or offset for baselines of spectra to repeat and collect 100% lines several times? Um, you will see a little bit of fluctuation. An FTIR, I, I once heard somebody describe an FTIR as being the world's most sensitive vibration detector. And you will see a little bit of fluctuation up and down but you should not see substantial amounts. And sometimes that fluctuation is due to air currents, slight vibrations, um, a number of different things. When you see a substantial baseline offset consistently on collecting spectra, what that sometimes means is you're attenuating the light somewhere and um, you don't have your sample optical path exactly the same as your reference optical path. Okay. Um, right here on slide 2324, you mentioned about an ASTM standard number. And uh, some, mm -hmm. some folks in our audience wanted, wanted to repeat the ASTM number that we have, a standard number, um, so they can yep. write it down. Okay, the ASTM, ASTM standard is E1421. There are a number of different parts to it. Level zero is the one that is typically implemented by most of the instrument manufacturers. Um, I'm showing my age, but I actually sat on the committee when that was put together. And the level one test, I would not recommend um, trying to reproduce at all because um, there was a lot of discussion and, and basically it goes into much more detail than you need for an instrument that is performing in a typical analytical lab. Got it. Um, there's a question from Reed. If high-level equalization functions cause significant issues in collecting a spectrum, is there a specific situation or reason why you'd use them? Um, sometimes people want to use them because they're using them as a smoothing function. Um, a lot of instrument vendors have built in all of the functions that are published in the literature because they're considering research applications and uh, research applications, you can never actually figure out, you know, people are doing research and there may be a reason for doing it. But in general, um, why would you want to use it? You would want to use it if you want to apply additional smoothing before you go in and start doing a smooth on the spectrum itself. Um, the, uh, a lot of the information on appetization functions was published oh, in the early to mid 1970s in places like analytical chemistry and applied spectroscopy. 
There is a very good book, um, and the authors are Peter Griffiths and James DeHassett, which talks about all of the ins and outs. And there is a chapter on appetization functions that does um, uh, give you some of the places where you would want to use a strong appetization function. Um, at the end of the fourth lecture, I'm going to, I will give you um, web addresses to some useful resources. And one of them is a bibliography of books that um, we have found useful. Uh, and one of them is Griffiths and DeHassett. I, I just don't have that web address in front of me right now. Right, right. So there's another question is, why is higher resolution always not desired? And what do I lose in going after a higher resolution? If you use high resolution on a condensed phase spectrum, a solid or a liquid, you're not losing anything. But what you are doing is you're taking more time to collect a spectrum than you absolutely need to. Let's think about what a single infrared band looks like. You're looking at a Lorentzian. And the full width at half max, and what that, what that refers to is looking at the band from the baseline to the top and then going halfway down. The full width at half max of most condensed phase materials is about 10 wave numbers. The Nyquist sampling frequency says that if you want to measure the resolution of an item, you want to have at least two data points for every resolution element. So if you are measuring something that is 10 wave numbers wide, you're going to want to have about four data points in the top of that um, peak. If you're collecting at four wave numbers, you're getting eight data points. If you're collecting at eight wave numbers, you're getting four, which is adequate to define that peak. As you start to go to higher and higher resolutions, you're adding in more data points, which is naturally going to add in a slight amount of noise. But most importantly, the higher the resolution, for every change in resolution step, you're doubling the amount of time it takes to collect. And if we look at the chart on this slide, you can see that as we went from eight wave numbers, which took 30 seconds, to four wave numbers, it took a minute, to two wave numbers, it took two minutes, to one wave number at four minutes, and you're not gaining anything here in the um, definition of the shape of your peak or in the accuracy of your data. All right. Philippe Dow has a very fundamental question. Can you please go over the definition for the 100% line? Yeah. OK. Let's go back to here. What you're doing with a 100% line is you are collecting your background at a certain number of scans and a certain resolution. Um, typically, we use in our lab 16 scans with four wave number resolution. So you collect your background, you get a nice single beam, like um, some of the ones that I showed you early, um, like this one, so you get a nice single beam. Then without changing anything in the spectrometer setup, you go and you collect another spectrum and make that your sample. Again, you take it at four wave numbers with 16 scans. So what you've gone and done is you have matched the resolutions, you've matched the data collect times. And if you ratio, and you haven't changed the optical path, so when you ratio those two data files and plot that in transmission, 
you should get a line that's at 100% transmission, okay, and should be flat within the def within the instrument vendor's definition. You might see a little bit of carbon dioxide and a little bit of CO2 on there because they're ubiquitous. All right. Um, there was another question or a comment you made why wave number lower than 500 is not accurate. And you have some, some, uh, some of the folks would like to know the reason why so. I didn't say it wasn't accurate. What I was referring to is that when you do the experiment that I was talking about, where you calculate a 100% line, you may see what I've heard people call as the long wavelength wag. And if you look closely at this spectrum, you'll see that it's got a little bit more noise on it. All that means is that you're ratioing um, a smaller number against a smaller number. And if we look really closely at the y-axis here, you'll see that we're only getting a deviation from the 100% line of about 0.1% uh, transmission. For all qualitative applications, perfectly usable. For 99.99% .99 of the quantitative applications, perfectly usable. All that I was pointing out here is that you can get this kind of feature where you're ratioing the low end of the single beam, where you have very little energy, against another one where you have very little energy, and that's going, whoops, and that's going to give you that type of feature. And if we look at the single beam that I've just put up, you can see that in the region that I was talking about, we have very little energy in comparison to the top of the response curve. All right, thanks, Ellen. There are a couple of questions on general FTIR use. Um, and one of them is, should I keep FTIR running 24 hours or to shut it down at the end of the day? And, and sort of related one is, should I purge the instrument with nitrogen to keep the instrument in and dry? Okay, let's talk about first about shutting it down. Um, in an FTIR, uh, in the interferometer, very minor changes on the order of optical shifts of microns can impact the optical paths of the instrument. If you keep an instrument turned on, the instrument vendors have designed them so that they stay thermostated and the temperature remains the same and you should be getting a response on Monday is exactly the same as you get on Tuesday. My recommendation, you should keep the instrument on all the time so that it stays at a constant temperature. I've actually unfortunately had the situation where it was the middle of the winter, the power failed in the building, and then the heating system failed. And when we came in in the morning, the instrument had turned itself back on because the power came back on, but the instrument would not align properly. Uh, we couldn't collect good data. We had to let it sit until it warmed up like all the people in the lab. So from that standpoint, you want to keep it turned on all the time. Purging the instrument is a different situation. Um, most instrument vendors now have designed instruments that are what they call sealed and desiccated. In a sealed and desiccated instrument, what that means is you've got a desiccant cartridge in there. Um, the inside of the instrument is sealed to the outside and you get 100% line that shows very little water and CO2. This is from a sealed and desiccated instrument um, where we're looking here at the changes that were due to opening and closing the sample compartment. 
in an instrument that is not sealed and desiccated, and typically those are research instruments, you want to purge that instrument with dry gas where you have no carbon dioxide. There's two ways of doing that. One is to purge it with the boil off of a liquid nitrogen tank, and that will remove all the water vapor and all the carbon dioxide so that you will get nice, clean, flat, 100% lines. The other way to do that is to use an air dryer purifier that's, that's hooked up to a compressor so that it will provide you with a clean, dry source of purge gas, again, to eliminate the water vapor and the CO2. Uh, so where I'm coming from is it very much depends on what the situation is, what the design of your instrument is, and how um, much you need to get rid of uh, the carbon dioxide and water vapor. If you're running a microscope, it's a different situation because using an infrared microscope your stage area is open, which means then that you are exposing the area of your sample is to water vapor and CO2. And in a lot of cases, what is done is that that whole sample area is purged so that you get rid of the water and the CO2. Okay. All right. We oh, one more, one more thing. One more thing that I think will help the attendees. On the same model of instrument, I have used both purged with boiler from liquid nitrogen and purged from an air compressor with a dryer scrubber, and there has been no difference in what I see for the quality of the purge. All right, we'll try to take two or three questions the time we have. Um, mm -hmm. What is the proper order to do peak processing, such as do you do ATR correction, followed by baseline correction, equitization, et cetera? But just some comments on how to go about doing this properly. Okay, appetization is built into the Fourier transform. So once you've collected your interferogram, that particular function is built in and when you get out the data, you will have an appetized spectrum. Once you have that data, you next come to how I should process it. If you look at, I'm gonna bring up the spectrum that showed um, the funny feature. Uh, the first thing you'd wanna do here is you want to ATR correct. Now, I know, because I collected this data, that this was collected in an ATR accessory, and this particular one was not ATR corrected. Once you ATR correct, you're going to change the relative ratio of short wavelength peaks to long wavelength peaks. So the first thing you want to do is you want to ATR correct. Once you've done the ATR correct, you want to assess where the baseline lies and then decide if you want to baseline correct your spectrum. And sometimes using an ATR, you will see baseline effects due to the ATR element uh, or your sample. And actually, that's something I'm going to discuss next week. All right. We'll still take, uh, take two questions here. Um, the question from Mark that asks, what can cause the transmittance level to be greater than 100%? Uh, and sort of other question is, can that be a real number if it's more than 100%? Um, can it be a real number? No. Uh, what can cause it? Well, the first thing that can cause it is that the amount of energy that started at the source was higher in the background than it was in the sample, okay? That's the first thing. Uh, that source fluctuation should not be happening. 
Another place where you can get that kind of effect is if you've got a bubble in a liquid sample. That can cause your baseline to be over 100%. Uh, a third situation is where you might have some sort of a reflection happening in the spectrometer where more light is getting to the detector than should be. So in general, if and I don't mean the difference between 100 and 100.05. I mean the difference between 100 and 105. So if you're seeing those types of things, you've got some sort of an optical problem or a uh, parameter set problem. Because again, um, if you have a situation with an attenuator or a resolution aperture, a J-stop, and they're not set exactly the same for the sample in the background, you're going to see that. All right, we're at the top of the hour here. Let me just address some housekeeping questions that I've had. Um, will the presentation be sent or, or a recording for it? So, you know, after the after the stock is done, you will automatically get a recording for today's session and you can go back and reference to it uh, for everyone who has registered with us. The other one was, Will I have invite for subsequent sessions? Um, if you look at our invitation that we sent, you should see a link to register for uh, the next three talks in the series. So we will have talks for um, on every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so just use the same link and register for, for, the, for the next series of talks. I, I realize there are a few questions that we were not able to get to. Um, we will still try to wrap up now on time and um, We'll get back to you in person with, with your answers there. So with that, I wanted to thank Ellen and the Society for Applied Spectroscopy, um, and also my team here at Perkin Elmer for putting this together. I can see with the level of involvement we have and all the questions pouring in that uh, this has been a, been a quite successful sessions for us. And, you know, we thank you for engaging with us. Um, with and that, let us... Sure, go ahead, Ellen. What I was going to say is on behalf of the Society for Applied Spectroscopy, I'd like to thank Perk and Elmer for allowing us this opportunity to advance our educational mission. Okay. Absolutely. So we'll wrap it up, everybody. That will be a wrap for the day. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, we will see you next Thursday. And feel, feel, uh, feel free to forward this to, uh, to anybody else who may be interested your friends or, or the company at large, even if it's not in US uh, or, or in North America, I should say in other parts, um, if they register, they will get a recording for, for the webcast. Thanks everybody, have a nice day and, um, and the weekend coming up, so have a nice weekend too. Thank you, Evan. Thank you. <laughs>